Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Brian Thatcher, and welcome to Mercy Unbound. It's a series that aims to provide hope, an avenue for healing, and one that will help, help you live and understand the great mercy of God. With me today, I have a priest all the way from Canada, Vancouver. Um, he's going to talk to us about his own story and his love of the Eucharist. You know, Father uh, Richard Conlon is a priest in the Diocese of Vancouver, and the interesting story he, uh, I read, was a professional golfer, an accountant, and, you know, the Lord works in strange ways, and uh, here he is, a devout, devout Catholic priest, and I'm just excited to have him uh, with us today on Mercy Unbound. Father, you know, this uh, Feast of Corpus Christi, the church kicked off a three-year revival on the Eucharist because Catholics don't really understand the real presence in our ministry, Eucharistic Apostles of the Divine Mercy, we spread the Divine Mercy message, but also the real presence. So this topic is near and dear to me. And, uh, you know, the same Jesus in the consecrated host is the same Jesus in the image. So why don't you start off and just uh, tell us a little bit, how did a professional golfer ever become a Catholic priest? Yes. Well, thank you, Brian, for having me on the show. It's a, a gift to always share what God has done in my life. And I hope it blesses more people. Uh, so for myself, I grew up in Vancouver and I discovered the first love of my life at the age of nine when I played golf. It was the only sport I could beat my brother at, actually. He was older than me, bigger, faster, stronger, and golf was the one sport I could beat him at. So I thought from the age of nine that that's what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And it really was uh, the love of my life. Everything in my my whole life revolved around playing golf. And I, as you know, I got to a very competitive uh, high level at a young age. So I was on the Canadian national team when I was in grade 10. So at the age of 15, I got to travel around on Team Canada. And I thought that my whole life would just be something of golf. And as far as my Catholic faith, I grew up Catholic, but I just thought, being Catholic was for old people. Uh, and so I thought, you know what, I'm going to get back into it when I'm really old, because I had a basic level of faith. And I, you know, you want that fire insurance before you're done, that you want to make sure you can get to heaven. So I thought that I thought that's what the Catholic faith was all about, just finding the way to get to heaven. Uh, I had a lot of things happen in my college golf career, I played college golf at St. Mary's College in California. So division one golf in California and traveled all around the States. Uh, in my last year, I was the top player on my team. And I was right at that turning point of continuing on for professional golf or finding something else to do. And I just had I had three events that really changed my life all at once. Uh, the first thing was a girl that I was dating, uh, her mom had asked her to read a book called Heaven is for Real. And this is just a children's book about uh, Colton Burpo's near-death experience. And for some reason, reading this children's book, it started making me ask big questions about life. Like, what is my purpose of life? Why am I here? Is my purpose just to play golf or is it something else? Uh, the second thing that happened is that my mom, who had been recently diagnosed with stage four cancer, she had asked me to go to confession for her birthday. Mm. That was her birthday wish. Now, that was a huge request because I had not been practicing my Catholic faith for five years. And so for my mom to ask me of that, um, it was a really bold request but obviously something that she felt inspired by God to do. And uh, it was at the perfect timing of having just read that book, Heaven is for Real. And then all of a sudden I get this email that for my birthday, my mom's telling me she wants me to go to confession. The third thing is I decided I was no longer going to continue on with professional golf. I was going to come back home and uh, find something else to do with my life. Now, those three things kind of weave together in a confession experience in which I thought I completely scandalized this priest. Like I told him five years of a total college party lifestyle that was in no way connected to anything virtuous or Catholic. 
But when I left that confession, I felt this experience of freedom and peace that nothing in the world could have provided for me. Like when I was in college and I was living the party lifestyle, I had access to kind of whatever I wanted. I was always going out, partying, doing whatever, buying whatever I wanted, eating out almost every meal and playing golf. It was what people consider the good life. But after this confession experience is like, wow, there's a level of peace and joy in my heart that I never experienced before. And I really felt like I was given a new life for the first time that God really wiped clean the slate. And that led up to the first time I received the Eucharist that Sunday. For some reason, I knew in my heart when I received Holy Communion that it was not bread, that it was actually a, a real person, the same person who had just forgiven my sins and confession, uh, Jesus through the priest was the same person that just entered into my body through Holy Communion. And I remember crying uh, that day. I remember crying for all the times that I received Holy Communion in college. Because I'd go to Mass maybe once a month or something, just, and I'd receive Holy Communion, you know, not knowing that I was not allowed to in a state of mortal sin. And so it was a, a crying over all the times I received Jesus sacrilegiously uh, or out of indifference. And then also just the intimacy that I experienced this first time that Jesus was not just someone who wipes away my sins, but he wants to enter into my body. And so that experience of receiving him set my heart on fire. Um, I went home that day and my parents were making lunch. And I went into my room and all of a sudden the thought about watching pornography came up. And I remember sitting at my computer and thinking, okay, what am I going to do? And I felt Jesus just saying, okay, what do you want? Do you want the new life that I've just given you? Or do you want to go back to your old life? I remember so clearly just telling Jesus, I'm, I'm, done. I'm sick. <laughs> like I'm so sick of my old life. I want a new life. And I just, I gave my life to Jesus in my room on that day, uh, 11 years ago. And I ran downstairs and I told my parents that my life's changed. And I started contacting all of my friends, uh, family members, telling them, telling them that I'd met Jesus. Uh, a lot of friends that I've been going out, you know, partying, drinking with, I said, I'm not going anymore. I, I've met <laughs> Jesus. And that ended about 95% of my friendships. Uh, and then oddly or providentially enough, right after that, I met a girl, a good Catholic girl, strong Catholic for the first time. I thought, oh, wow, Jesus just put the right girl into my life as soon as I got my act together. And now I'm practicing Catholic. And I thought I was going to get married to her. But as I grew in my faith and I started going to daily mass and adoration and reading books about my faith, I had this burning desire to want to give my whole life for this. And a priest gets to do that. He gets to give his entire life uh, for Jesus, to be a sign of Jesus to the world. And it seemed like God really was inviting me into that experience. Now, funny enough, I had never thought of the priesthood once up to that point, except for one moment in my life. At the age of seven, my dad came into the Catholic Church. He was a part of the United Church in Canada, Protestant denomination. And at the reception for my dad's uh, full entrance into the Catholic Church, the Archbishop at the time had this beautiful gold and red pectoral cross. And I asked him as a seven-year-old kid if I could have it at the reception. And he said, if you become a priest, I'll give it to you. And I remember that was the only day in my whole life I thought about becoming a priest until after all of this experience back at the, when I was 22, uh, I started thinking about it again broke up with my girlfriend to start fully discerning 
And then when I got accepted to the seminary, I visited the archbishop, the, the former archbishop. He was 90 years old at the time. And I, I showed him a picture from the event and I told him and he's like, oh, so you're after my pectoral cross now, aren't you? I'm like, yes, I'm going to get that cross. <laughs> And uh, so, I mean, looking back now, it's a beautiful sign that God had like planted a seed. You know, I believe God called me from all eternity to be a priest. And that was just one little experience of his delight in me that, yep, yeah, this is what I want you to do. Uh, I don't want you to pursue professional golf anymore. I don't want you to do any other path. I want you to be my priest. And uh, so I've been a priest for a year and a half now. And it's been, yeah, it truly is the, there's nothing else I'd rather do in the whole wide world than to become a priest. Like I can still play golf at a very competitive level, but I, I tell people with total honesty in my heart, like there's no ounce of a lie that I would way rather be a priest than be high on the PGA tour, uh, making millions. There's, there's nothing I'd rather do. Father, uh, do you are you uh, in a parish now? And and yeah. you you do you do a lot on the internet. You've got a lot of sermons on the internet and blog, don't you? Yeah, what yeah. It, what's that so, site, or how do people get your sermons? Yeah, when I when I had my conversion first, uh, what I loved to do was write summaries of books, and I had been doing that with business books or self help books before. And I changed that all into Catholic books. So uh, the year before seminary, I started a blog called Prodigal Catholic, in which I would just give away Catholic stuff. So I'd give away all of my notes about book summaries that I'd written to anyone who wanted to read them. Uh, and so I'd been doing that throughout all of seminary. So I don't know how many books I might have on there, maybe 100 to something like that, 100, 150 books that I've read where I have the summaries. And then when I was ordained a priest, uh, it was during the lockdown of COVID. So there was a really strong call to start to evangelize online. So we, do, we brought in a live stream system here at Corpus Christi Parish, and we started recording all of our uh, masses and all of our homilies would be cut out of the live stream of mass and then also published online. So I have a YouTube page as well, uh, just under my name, in which it has all of my homilies uh, over the last, since being a deacon. So over the last two years or so, I have all of my Sunday homilies and, and some other things online. Um, we've done some interviews and different things like that with, with people. So we, we've tried to evangelize online and that was a, uh, a COVID inspiration, for right. sure. Now, Father, the church, as I mentioned, is in this three-year push to really help Catholics understand the real presence. And, um, you know, many people, I, I have a very, very good husband, wife, couple friends of ours, and they're great people, uh, good Christian people. But he mentioned to me about a month ago that he had left his church. And I said, well, why did you leave the church? And he said, because the music is so much better at this other church. Mm. And, um, you know, that's a common thing one hears. The sermons are bad or the music isn't the greatest. And um, did the Eucharist play a role in all in your becoming a priest or your conversion back to church? Mm. Yeah, like I would say the the first thing that got me really wanting to become a priest was confession, like wanting to be able to give that gift to other people. And then after that, I developed a love for the mass and I started going to daily mass and adoration and being in front of Jesus real presence and adoration. We had a perpetual adoration chapel close by my home. That was when I really learned how to pray and uh, develop that hunger for the mass. And I know like, I would never want to go on any vacation or any trip or any hiking thing if I couldn't go to daily mass. It was just like, it's not worth it. I, I, don't, I don't want to. Uh, so that was something in which I started to really develop this love for Jesus, um, not even being able to put it into words, but it was certainly there. And 
now as a priest, I, I do realize that the mass is my favorite thing or, or her favorite most intimate time with Jesus. I, I do absolutely love celebrating mass and it's been a joy to enter more deeply into that um, experience. Now your friend brings up a, a good point, at least like everything in the mass should help us experience the beauty and the truth and um, the real presence of the Eucharist. So as Catholics, we're so used to having different signs like the bells, you know, they're warning bells like, hey, something important is going to happen soon. And the music should draw us into worship and adoration and all of that. And, and some of us really need those signs to lead us into Jesus' real presence, because it is a crazy belief, yeah. in a sense, that what looks like bread, what tastes like bread, what feels like bread, is not bread. It's a, it's a living person, not just any living person. It is God who created the universe out of nothing, who holds the universe in existence, who is the, the whole reason we exist. It's a, it's a shocking belief. Um, and so, like, to hit back on that, that point about your friend, like, leaving a church because of the music or something, obviously, we have to be able to get to a level of faith in which it's not about the homily, it's not about the music, um, it's not about how the church looks or anything like that, and it, it is truly about Jesus and everything else is secondary. But we are called, for sure, as Catholics, to do all that we can to bring beauty to the liturgy in which people can start to uh, experience more and more deeply the truths of the Eucharist. So there, there is something at least in there. There's a desire that he has to want to have that encounter with God in the liturgy. You know, Father, uh, wasn't going to go in this direction, but in the diary of Faustina, she talked about the greatest miracles take place in the confessional. And I thought of that when you said that that was what hit you first about the sacrament of reconciliation. And I was a liver specialist and I saw a lot of alcoholics and, you know, studied the 12 steps. And, and in the fifth step, it talks about, you know, you tell your sponsor and another person everything, you know, you got to let the truth out. And it's so freeing. And I don't think people understand that. Um, the confessional is such a place of healing. That's the second sacrament of mercy, really. Uh, yeah. So I'm not surprised you were drawn by the sacrament of confession. Yeah. And, the, and there is a, a deep connection between confession and the Eucharist. And I think a real love and devotion for the Eucharist should lead us to a greater desire for confession a lot of the modern saints that speak so profoundly about the truth of the eucharist it is quite evident also of their love for confession as you'd see in saint john paul ii mother Teresa, and saint faustina just to name some i remember a line when the pope came to denver in the early 90s his comment was your your eucharist lines are so long but your confession lines are so short you know, and it's, it's kind of a sad thing when you think about it, because as Jesus said, that's where the greatest miracles take place. <clears throat> it is, yeah. And that was something that uh, was probably my most profound experience, I would say, as a priest, uh, was, the, was this past Palm Sunday. Uh, we had a talk by, um, this speaker came in and he said, you, you need to pray um, to Jesus and say, Jesus, what breaks your heart? You need to ask that question to Jesus. What breaks your heart? And then ask Jesus, may you break my heart for what breaks your heart? So it's this two part. It's like, Jesus, what breaks your heart? And then can you allow that to break my heart as well? And on Palm Sunday, I was distributing Holy Communion and to cut the long story short, there were three experiences of 
people showing signs of just abs complete indifference to the Eucharist. Uh, and I all of a sudden, I felt something happen in my heart. Like there was a heaviness and I, I felt like my heart was breaking. Um, I was experiencing just a little, you know, a little drop compared to the ocean of God's heartbreak for the indifference and the sacrilege that is committed against him in the blessed sacrament. Um, and I didn't know what to do with it. And the, the next day, which was Monday of Passion Week, when I went up to read the gospel, I read, uh, I saw the word Judas. And for some reason, it just triggered in me, uh, you know, about Judas, his indifference, his, the sacrilege I, he probably committed at the Last Supper with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. And my, I just broke down and I started weeping uh, in mass because of the lukewarmness, the coldness of heart, the indifference um, that people show towards Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. And uh, it was a gift to share just a tiny bit uh, in what God feels in this sacrament of love that he gives to us and, and how easy it is just to be indifferent or lukewarm or cold toward that awesome gift that he gives us. And so that was uh, a, a huge gift that I received as a priest from God. It was, there's only a few times in my life where I actually realized something is like a pure gift. Like often we speak about everything is a gift from God. There's only certain times where you're like, you're kind of blown away at the fact that I did not do this in any way. Like I'm not even, I'm not even um, as though I didn't bring this about from my own holiness in any sense. This is just like God breaking into my life to say like, I want you to have this experience because for some reason. Um, and that was, that was a real gift. So that, that deepened my love for, the Eucharist and the celebration of mass and being very off almost uh, every Sunday mass here, our parish is called Corpus Christi. So we're, we are known for our Eucharistic devotion. And just before Sunday distribution of Holy Communion, just constantly finding ways to remind people uh, about what's about to happen. And if they're not properly disposed, why they should ask for a blessing. That was one of the fruits that came out of that experience as well. Um, so it, it has been the source and summit of my priesthood for sure is, is the Eucharist. And I regularly preach about it as a result, because I guess we talk about what we love the most, you know? And so it keeps coming back as a theme for everything I have to talk about. I was wondering, um, if you like to talk on it because, um, you know, like you said, you, you talk about what you love the most and what your heart's on fire about. And our, our ministry, I don't know if I can even show you here, but um, we're the Eucharistic Apostles. And our motto is a host with the rays of blood and water coming forth. And Faustina actually had that vision on several occasions of the mm -hmm. rays of blood and water emanating from the monstrance and then went out to the world. And, yeah. um, you know, it's if people really understood the real presence, you know, they, it would really change the world, I think, because um, <clears throat> they'd be knocking down the doors to get to mass, you know? Yeah. I'm sure in Canada, you're, you're all the hockey fans and things and our Tampa Bay Lightning. And, um, you know, we, we can fill up Amelie Arena with 20,000 people, no problem to watch a Lightning hockey game. And that's really, how the churches should be overflowing if they understood Jesus Christ is going to be here at 9 30 you know yep so well that's at least what it's like in heaven you know that's the main event <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's in heaven where the veil's removed it's uh there's no greater no greater thing than to be in the Lord's presence for sure and uh yeah there is that we had the Eucharistic miracle exhibit here recently sometimes I've thought about that as well. Like, wow, if we had a Eucharistic miracle happen here, this church would be flooded. 
so many people will come to see. But in how the Lord works, it's as though he, he doesn't work like that. God just, like, he's so, he's so gentle. He's so kind of hidden in his ways of how he loves us. And just that invitation of like one person at a time. And, and uh, I am, you know, kind of blown away at how God doesn't seem to really do the fireworks and the, yeah the uh, the ways to get people because he certainly could all he had to all he has to do is just open the veil just a little bit and allow what saint faustina saw to to happen on a, a big public scale and people would come and people would worship but um just as in jesus public ministry i mean he rose people from the dead and how many people were there at the cross there were yeah. there were disciples just a couple just a handful uh the same is true today but the, what changed the world were saints. And, and that's the consistent story of today. Like people like St. Faustina, those were the ones who really changed the world. And so that's what I find hopeful um, when, I, when I have parish ministry and I'm facing the reality of how many people are away from the church and how many people just don't even go to Sunday mass. And it can be a cause for despair, but I got to remind myself that, you know, what is, what was Jesus model? Jesus model was paying attention to the one person in front of him, investing his life in the 12 and setting them on fire to become saints. And, and that's where I think our hope can be found as well, is that us focusing on, you know, who are the people God has entrusted to me? to set on fire to become saints obviously starting first with my myself and yourself that uh we can't give what we don't have and so we need to be set afire by the lord yeah. you know as i've gotten older i've realized like when my kids were younger i used to you know give them these great talks and thought they were so inspirational but i realized most of it went you know in one ear and out the next <clears throat> and now i look back and i see they really learn more from my example and I need to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. And uh, I think that's what I've learned as a father is uh, talk is cheap. And uh, being a Catholic Christian is not easy mm -hmm. in today's world, is it? I mean. No. Yeah, yeah it, it, is, it is super, super difficult. Um, uh, one, one I, I really like to use analogies and images in all my ways to understand things. And one way to think about it is uh, a river. And, and on one side, you have heaven. On the other side, you have hell. And, uh, you know, back maybe at the time of your parents or something, you know, the river was kind of flowing towards heaven. Like as long as you just stayed in the church like everyone was going to church, everyone was participating in the sacraments more or less. And at least in our Western world, like a lot of people were, and the society supported everything going in that direction. And so only, only several people, you know, went against the flow of the river and they were atheists, you know, or whatever. And it was like very shocking uh, back then. But today the river is really going in the opposite direction. <laughs> It really is like like flowing aggressively against the church, and so if you just if you're just in floating mode, if you're just on a floaty and you're just you're just coasting, you're gonna find yourself not going to Sunday mass, not getting married in the church, all these things because the society is just pulling everyone away from the church. But the good news, as Fulton Sheen says, is you know, only a dead thing floats with the stream, but a, something alive always can go against it, you know, and so for us to be fully alive, uh, that's what the call is today. We have to aggressively go against the current of today, and when people see us fully alive, going against what the culture promotes, uh, all of a sudden we'll be of notice. You know, it's like the TV series, The Chosen, 
the beautiful uh, introduction opening clip in which all the fish are just these gray kind of lifeless going slow. And then all of a sudden one fish turns away and it becomes uh, a bright color of aqua. And then it grabs the attention of other fish. And then you see this image of which there are 13 fish. So the 12 apostles and Jesus going against the stream. And those are the ones that are alive. Those are the ones that are colorful. And so it's a helpful image for us today, I find. I'm called to be fully alive. I'm called to, and that means I have to go against the stream of what this culture is trying to drag me into. It's for sure. It's it reminds me of a movie well before your time, but um, <clears throat> called The Poseidon Adventure, and the uh, cruise ship had flipped upside down, and people were just walking down the usual way, but they were going down to their death, and they didn't mm -hmm. even realize it. And there was a few that realized things were upside down and they were going against the grain and ended up being saved. And I mm. think that in a way is of the world. Uh, the, they're good people. They just don't see uh, what, what's going on. And, and uh, God is love. And Father, before we close out today's show, what other words of wisdom would you like to give to the people on the gift of the Eucharist and mm. you know, what you've gleaned from your priesthood so far? Mm. One of my favorite images of the Eucharist is a big game of hide and go seek. Is that Jesus, he's, he's hidden, you know, and he has the heart of a child. And it is only the childlike that enjoy that game to seek him. And it is only in seeking him with all our hearts that we start to strip away other things. Like we start to forget about worries of the world we start to forget about other things that might grab our attention and when we seek jesus with the heart of a child we start to um, pursue him alone he starts to order the rest of our lives uh, as though it's more of like a game in which we're constantly seeking him and so it really does take the heart of a child to discover Jesus, his real presence, and why he's hidden in the Eucharist, hidden out of love for us, to draw us close to him. And so every time we go to Eucharistic adoration, every time we go to Mass, uh, I find the game of hide and go seek is a helpful image, an invitation for us to have childlike hearts to discover why the God who is love is hiding in the tiny white host. Father, what um, <clears throat> words would you like to share with those who have committed, you know, been off track like you have, like I have, and they don't think they're good enough? Uh, what would you like, what would you say to them? Oh. Well, if I can be a priest, anything is possible. <laughs> like, like I, I openly share about how poor my life was before my conversion to give people hope that you, you look at my life or you read the stories of the saints that had quite rebellious pasts and were constantly, or just open up the gospels and, and hear about the apostles, you know. Um, it is so true that if we're inspired by the stories of others who have similar experiences as us, then all of a sudden we can set aside those excuses to realize, no, Jesus knows it all and he is fiercely committed to calling me to follow him and so just be inspired by the stories of others that have gone on the journey before and there's no sin you know <clears throat> i as i travel i see a lot of women uh who've had abortions come up and you know they just can't forgive themselves you know and it's, it's a great burden on them but yet god forgives them i mean with true repentance, he forgives them, doesn't he? Yeah, that's where confession can be transformational. If you go to confession and you confess the sin of abortion, you could say, I know for certain that God forgave me on this day, at this time, in this place. And if God can forgive me at this day, this time, this place, then I can forgive myself. And so you have a concrete event, a real event in which you can constantly use as a reference point to go on that journey of forgiveness. 
because it is not just a one-time experience for the whole journey. For God, it's a one-time event, but there's a journey that we have to go on as well because of our human nature. And, but to be able to rely upon that experience that God has given us, uh, that can be a huge source of inspiration for people to uh, continually uh, forgive themselves as well. It's got to be refreshing if you're the priest in the confessional and people come in and said, uh, Father, forgive me, my last confession was 50 years ago. You know, that's got to be a yeah. good feeling. Yes, it is. Uh, that's what I what I live for, really, to to get as many people as possible to heaven. Um, that's at the heart of my my ministry as a priest. So it's it's a real joy when those when those experiences come my way from God. That's awesome. Well, Father Richard Conlon, I want to thank you, a diocese and priest uh, from Vancouver, Canada. Um, great story and a wonderful priest on the internet on a prodigal Catholic blog. And uh, you can pull up his name and read a lot of his uh, sermons and hear his sermons and things. And Father, just keep up the great work up there. Uh, the world needs uh, good holy priests. And God bless you and keep up the great work. Thanks, Dr. Brian. I'm a huge fan of the Divine Mercy devotion, and so it's great to hear the work that you're doing. St. Faustina has been one of the biggest inspirations for me, just getting deeper into the mystery of the Eucharist, and so I love the work that you're doing, and I'll keep you in my prayers as well. Thank you. Well, we we'll hope our cross passing in, and we can get you back and share Divine Mercy. So, uh, okay. people, hope you enjoy the show. Please subscribe and uh, share it with friends, and let's get the word out in these three years of Eucharistic revival. And uh, Jesus said, I've come to set the earth on fire and how I wish it were already ablaze. So let's get it rolling. So thank you again, Father. God bless everybody. Have a wonderful day. Amen. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel for the video portion. The podcast can be heard at anchor.fm slash dr. Brian, B-R-Y-A-N, Thatcher, T-H-A-T-C-H-E-R. And on all the major podcast forums. I would love to speak at your church or conference. And please consider supporting our efforts to spread the truth to a hurting world. Thank you again. And for more information, go to the website at drbrianthatcher.com.